Hello everyone, this is Singularity Watch, the show where we delve into the future development of technology and what this means for society and our world. I'm Oli and today our usual co-host uh, Kavya Perlman is not here, so we're going to say hello to Marco Magnano, who is the editor of the show. Hi Marco. Hello Oliver, hello, hello, hello everyone, and uh, well, it's a first start and so maybe uh, day by day we will start to change our team day by day and episode by episode but for now let's start excellent so our guest today is dr joshua cohen a media psychologist and a person who's constantly exploring the human mind and also seeking to integrate technology as a form of therapy um so i'm going to jump right in and ask you some some stuff uh, josh uh, most people have some notion of what psychology is and what psychologists do But uh, as I mentioned before, I'd wager to say it's often a wrong one, as happens with many jobs which have an abstract side to them. Uh, So they become kind of something mystical that we don't really know what's going on. Uh, So I'd like to really start from the basics just to give people some kind of understanding of what the main objectives or what the, you know, the main kind of, if you had to kind of sum it up, what does a psychologist do in very basic words so everyone can understand uh, what, how would you, you know, express that? Sure. And thank you. For, first of all, you guys, thanks for having me here today. I know you guys have had certain circumstances. I think the first thing about psychology is it is a healthcare field. You know, it's based on philosophy. Mm-hmm. And then, it, you know, it branched off into, you know, some things that were practical with Jung and Freud. And Freud and Jung were psychiatrists. So that became an MD field. So now they give out medicine, and that's a separate field. You have to, you know, they have to look at cadavers. They have uh, their mm-hmm. medical doctors. So psychiatrists used to do talk therapy, which is, um, you know, now considered something that only psychologists do. And so psychologists, marriage and family therapists, anyone called a therapist usually does talk therapy. Psychiatrists mm-hmm. give out medicine. Right, that's that's excellent. And what are the what is the objective of a psychologist when when you kind of uh, if, what could somebody expect if they were going uh, to talk to one? What would the kind of general objective be uh, for most psychologists, at least? I guess. Well, I think you know, contrary to what a lot of people think, you know, psychology is about. I believe it's about appreciating life because the the idea of it being based on psychology and philosophy is sort of it, this is where it should be what it's actually become is symptom reduction so mm-hmm. what freud said is it's about love and work so that's that was kind of the goal i i would hope that one would aspire to become more, more focused on just survival though but that's what the insurance companies usually reimburse for so if you need more support oftentimes psychologists will work with coaches and they actually start looking more towards you know the future they don't have the oversight or the ethics uh, that mm-hmm. a licensed clinician would have or the privacy laws so that's one of the things that happens in therapy is you get privacy that sometimes uh, you know is taken so seriously that I, I could go into that for a while but it's the same as medical <laughs> doctors in that respect it's in, in the right. psychology you know the HIPAA laws so but there's um there's different laws all over the world okay but that's that's what they provide i would say is you're really trying to appreciate life and make your quality of life better okay and um uh just a couple of quick questions and then we'll we'll move on to the actual media part of it um but in terms of approach there are many different types of uh schools of psychology what is your uh, main kind of school of thought and what type of psychology do you provide Oh, I love that question because I, I, <laughs> I started out working with I, I love it because I, I love working with addictions. And I'll tell mm-hmm. you why, because there's a lot of trauma in it, at the root of it most of the time. And so I prefer working with trauma. So it's not so much the particular school because with, with addictions, you really have to work with like evidence based cognitive behavioral. My, my supervisor mm-hmm. said, righty, tidy, lefty, Lucy, make sure you really make sure they have some tools before you go into the deep end. And then the, the, the school of thought there after that is the psychodynamic approach. So the, the evidence-based is called cognitive behavioral pr- approaches. Mm-hmm. Usually those are the evidence-based ones. And then there's a lot of evidence also in the relationships or getting to the root of the problem. 
that's more relational. That's closer to what psychodynamic is about. So it's not so much the tools as it is relational, having that therapeutic relationship. That's really okay. what heals in psychodynamic. Uh, so are we talking about, when you talk, talk about uh, dynamics, are you talking about the different types of relationship dynamics between people in our lives and, you know, analyzing how people work in, in that sphere kind of thing? thing yeah. or, okay, cool. Um, right, so let's let's get into the to the other questions. <laughs> um, so, just, well, no more than I would go on talking for this for a long while, but I don't want to sort of uh, make it a podcast just on psychology. So, um, so twenty twenty has changed a large part of our lives, uh, starting with uh, uh, you know working from home and ending with the structural uncertainty of the era we're living in. Has this been a particularly important year for psychology as well? Oh, wow. That, that is a huge question. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's a very tough year for, for psychology, particularly uh, media psychology, because we have so many people that are in homes or at, in, in new situations without resources. And, and so um, when I talk about resources, I'm not talking about just the mental health challenges. There mm -hmm. are a lot of physical challenges that people are facing and they're turning to VR for, for connection. And yeah, they're also absolutely. looking for jobs. People are not getting uh, the money they used to get. So there's a lot of need out there. And that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to head up with our, with our program mm -hmm. is we really, and it's not just money that people need, they need social connection. That's really what this is, you know, about. And so with 2020, it's been a huge challenge for the whole world to try to figure this out, how to, how to reconnect and, and use these already existing technologies to, to bring that connection with one another. Yeah, that, that sounds like something really important and like an issue you hear about a lot. Um, going a bit deeper, you call yourself a media psychologist. So what does that add and how does that work? Good question. A lot of people don't even know what a media psychologist is. Uh, a lot, like you said, a lot of people don't even know what psychology is. So media psychology in, in my take on it is, well, first of all, let me tell you that the educational requirements are that you have to have a, at least a master's degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a PhD and I'm actually license eligible. So I a little bit more even higher up on that ladder but there, there's no like ladder really it's just if you meet the master's degree level you're already there okay um i've had a background of about 30 years in like film and media uh training as well i've trained as an avid editor in final cut pro in hollywood i've mm -hmm. worked in hollywood for a bit as a freelancer and for some a-list uh celebrities and i've also worked on the other end of the, the chair working with uh people as under somebody's license. So I've mm -hmm. had a good chance to really get a feel for what it's like to work with people in media, I've worked with addictions, I've worked with people in hospital settings, community mental health. So um, usually media psychologists don't have that same clinical training. That's something I really want, uh, but it's mm -hmm. not necessary. The media psychologist is usually out there on talk shows or out in the, the like using critical thinking and using the technologies to help people. And I've seen, you probably have heard of, if you like Dr. Joyce Brothers, Dr. Phil, mm -hmm. those are all media psychologists. So they're out there usually helping, giving information and, and getting helpful information, hopefully to the and resources to people to enrich and better their lives. Right. Okay. That's actually a figure I didn't actually know about. Uh, I mean, I, I know, it exists, but I didn't know it had an actual title to it, if you know what I mean, um, until, you know, seeing your your um, uh, resume and everything. Um, so you're the author and a co-editor of the book Video and Filmmaking as Psychotherapy Research and Practice. So you propose to make films a part of uh, psychotherapy in uh, academic writing. How does this work? And is this about, you know, um, self -na narration, you know, self narrative to, you know, how we tell ourselves our own life story, something like this? Well, uh, one of the chapters was done by a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Patton. He's the grandson of George Patton, uh, a famous general in World War II. 
And what mm-hmm. they do, and this is one of the unique things to the book, is they do multi-day filmmaking workshops on army bases and you know military bases across the country. And so when they make these movies, they found that in clinical trials, it actually reduces some of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, which a lot mm-hmm. of people in, with COVID, because I've had COVID, it can create symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And and so yeah. I've noticed that by doing these activities, and I've actually used VR too as part of my rehabilitation when I had COVID, using technologies like this where you connect to one another or you do physical activity can actually, it, it does change one's perspective, but it, it's a physical reaction. And a lot of trauma, psychological trauma, is actually lodged in the body, according to a famous psychologist by the name of uh, Bessel van der Kolk, or a colleague of his, Peter Levine, has a very similar philosophy. And so that's kind of what I try to emphasize in mm-hmm. a little bit in that book, and, and then later in the book I'm writing, specifically about VR and film and video-based therapy. It's really all the different chapters are about how to deal with trauma in different ways. So we have people from you know, in New York doing it with the animation project, doing 3D animations with at risk youth. They have people that are talking, uh, yeah, I don't want to ramble on too much, but the book is really has a lot of different authors with many different backgrounds. And that one that I mentioned with uh, General Patton's grandson is it's a real interesting and unique approach. Mm-hmm. I would like to do something like that with VR. Well, one of the reasons why I'm here is to start looking for developers because I'm a media psychologist. I'm not a developer. I want to find ways of making movies like that to help people suffering like that with, that are isolated, that want to make better movies to reduce their symptoms of post-traumatic stress, to reach out to one another and, and have that better connection. And so I think VR is a wonderful place to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's like it's kind of perfect timing as well for this kind of uh, thing, especially you were mentioning with COVID, um, the fact that it does create some, uh, you know, post-traumatic uh, stress. And I'm wondering, is is there any possibility that, uh, is there any chance that um, uh, something like that can influence autoimmune um, symptoms? Because they're not, they now think that the long COVID symptoms, you know, the long haulers, are connected to um, autoimmune reactions of the body. So I'm wondering if there's a psychological element to that as well. Absolutely. Uh, Some of the things I would say to start off with is if you have a positive mental attitude, it really does affect your immune system when you have COVID. The other things I would tell people is drink a lot of hot coffee, hot tea, or hot water. Because the Chinese say that it could flush it into your, the virus into your stomach and, and it could die there. If they're wrong, mm. it's just hot coffee, hot tea, or hot water. Yeah, exactly. And they do this no, it, I mean, <laughs> what difference does it make? So do it anyway, make you feel better. And even if it's a placebo effect, that will also boost your positive mental attitude, which mm. will affect your immune system. So that is, that is a definite fact that if you can fool yourself into thinking it works, then it will work. Yeah, and especially as I, uh, as there was even a research, a piece of research mentioning that even if you know about the placebo effect, it still works, and they've proven that. So that's that's really interesting. Um, well, let me yeah. stick on the on the media for for a while because when we talk about media in general, uh, we are usually referring now in this uh, in 2020 in the, in the contemporary era to what uh, one of the fathers of media theory like Marshall McLuhan would uh, define the cool media uh, involving more than say se- than one sense uh, uh, altogether so is there any kind of hierarchy between senses among senses in your work in your everyday therapy you know hearing or viewing or what kind of important do senses have and how do you think about stimulating them oh god i love that question because it goes right back to trauma (laughs) which is kind of i don't i don't it sounds like i love trauma i know it's it it, the reason i love trauma is because if you think of it in terms of post-traumatic growth everything's going to be awesome after that and so there's five things that i look for with trauma in the senses and it's that's why it's such a good question because if you think about cybam and I'm going to go back to this, but I just want to remember. So think of it, if you don't remember anything else I say just now, because you want me to simplify stuff. So <laughs> side bam, think of it as like side bam. You know, you'll do it with the gesture. But bam, but I just lose you. 
You've, You've teleported, teleported yourself, yourself to the side of the universe. Teleported to the side of the <laughs> That is awesome. We're on the, on the syllable bam. <laughs> on the syllable bam. That's, so I'm emphasizing this on you know, a really cool <laughs> way there. <laughs> <laughs> to emphasize bam without saying, without teleporting this time. And, and I, I'm glad I did that now because you'll remember that. <laughs> <laughs> the side bam, and, and I'm remembering the question, is about senses. When you when you orient to the senses, like teleporting and weird creating that sensation, there's a sensation when I teleport it. So then you have to think, where did it go? You know, and then you notice in your body what happened. Is there fear? Is there concern? Is there like what happened in that moment? Then then you look at the image. I'm over there. You know, that's that's the second part of the eye inside man. Then the behavior. Mm -hmm. I screwed up with my hand. So there's emotion there. There's this and then and then affect. Whoa, whoops, <laughs> embarrassment, you know, kind of like, you know, if I were real, you could see me flush, my face flush, hopefully. <laughs> and then, and then meaning, what's the meaning of that? Oh, I made a mistake. Let's correct it. Let's not do that again. And so Saibam and sensation in trauma is, you know, you can go through similar stages like that in, in, in a deeper way when you're actually going through trauma. So you can orient to pleasure or, or. Or something, it could be a, a photography, is something in the room, a nice colored light. If you scan the room and you look around, you can even do this in VR. You can, And there's a lot of apps for this too, probably, uh, you know, with meditation. But something to calm you down, it will regulate the, the autonomic nervous system. That's what sensation mm -hmm. does. So in media, it's really important to be aware of the images coming at us. So the sensations, image, behavior, affect, and meaning start to take place to, to regulate you. And that's why we, we encourage people to do something pleasurable in, in terms of getting that dopamine you know, it puts you in the body. It helps to regulate the autonomic nervous system and create what they call a ventral vagal response in somatic experiencing. Mm -hmm. Which it might be better to clarify uh, when, you know, you talk about the autonomic system because, you know, for anyone watching, that's basically your fight or flight versus uh, rest and digest system. So, you know, being relaxed and uptight or whatever. Um, so that's an acronym, right? Side yeah, down. so maybe what I was doing, yeah, so that's the acronym. I wanted to leave the, things with simple tools, not just the long explanation. So if nobody remembers anything else I say today, remember I teleported when I said, bam. <laughs> <laughs> you get a nice laugh, too, out of it, hopefully, and, and we'll remember it off the gag reel. Because humor excellent. can really, it's an involuntary response, and so is a lot of the sensation. But thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Um. Is there a story you find particularly interesting, uh, of course, with respect to the privacy of the patient, but something that you can express or say? Hmm. Stories, uh, maybe in, in relation to uh, trauma, addictions, or maybe the media? Uh, what, what would, what, I can think of a lot of stories. Well, um, I don't know, you choose. <laughs> no, okay, I'll go with the book then, because I had an 11-year-old boy one time, and I... I remember because i published on this he we put him in front of a green screen he was suffering from a lot of uh abuse from his father and so the, the poor boy just he could not cope with the fact that you know he had so much anger and the reason i put this in the book is because we, we were using the technology at the time and it was interesting to me that with certain kinds of art therapy he would react with like volcanoes. He would draw things that would show anger. But when we 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 shifted in the in in our with the technology inter, you know, intervention, um, which later would become something like VR, it, it looked a lot to me like he was shifting towards sadness, which is really good about connection. Sadness is is horrible as it is. It also brings people closer together. Mm. So. For him, this shifted from being angry at his father, who was kind of abusing him, but with corporal punishment. But he became sad and sort of accepted what was going on, even though there was nothing we could do legally you know, to protect this boy. But he was able to kind of say, look, I don't deserve this, but I can still be sad about it. And then it brought us closer to connecting to him in the stories that we told really reflected that and so you know he talked about a good boy from a happy home and a good boy from a sad home and we, when we use puppets which in vr would then become like avatars later and so if we mm -hmm. could do that 
if I could go back, I would definitely use Avatar. So then we could expand that universe for him because as soon as he got in touch with his sadness, then he was able to start imagining again. And that's what so, happens in trauma. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that, uh, does this mean that in this case, at least the anger was in some way secondary to the sadness, like it was a secondary emotion to that or uh, they're just different reactions to? Uh, a lot of depression people don't realize is that it's anger turned inwards, you know, and you get mad at yourself. That that's a lot of what depression is. Uh, it's okay. it's a lot more than that, but uh, that's it's it, our emotions are really complex. We are we're capable of feeling so many different things at once, and we're we're almost illiterate. And a lot of businesses don't realize that board board members, with if they could get more in touch with their feelings, like the, uh, there are certain companies like look at Kodak or Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. Maybe they could have done things to adjust to the environment a little differently. We're all facing those challenges now. But I've heard stories of different companies that maybe they needed to have been more emotionally intelligent to move, mm -hmm. to move forward. And so this happens in families. This happens in systems. If we could learn to get that language, some of the things that happen when you regulate the autonomic nervous system, you get out of the fight or flight response and you start getting into connection. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in you. You said that you know when you went towards the technological, um, using technological tools that allowed him to make different uh, kind of adaptations and and you know react in a different way and find different things within himself. So I'm wondering when we talk about VR, uh, this is something you're actively exploring. So what is why why do you think this is more effective and how can it be more effective than other types of uh you know than more traditional uh tools and you know i don't know i guess what i'm asking is why is it more effective and how can it improve on on what uh you're already doing basically yeah great question because what it, what it sounds like you're saying is we have these tools why is this even better than what we already have yeah um right now what we have is nobody's even allowed to be in certain areas, especially like I'm in California. We can't even see our therapist uh, in person usually. So we're left with the technology and most people are doing Zoom meetings. What we're doing here would be fantastic if people would adopt this kind of approach. Yeah. I think for many reasons. Uh, one is that you can you can hide behind your avatar for you know, it creates another protective persona which makes people feel more open actually about talking because they're less self-conscious. And, and we, yeah. you know, I, I don't know if that's how to, uh, I mean, it's a way of validating. And so I, I feel that um, the technology is so readily available right now. What, what makes it work in the, in the studies that we've done is it's the fun part that helps open up what already works with what well, we already know works with therapy is the therapeutic relationship. And that's what usually heals. So if people get past the stigma of dealing with the therapist, they can see how much it can actually help them to appreciate life, not just get past like, Oh, I feel like depressed. I, oh, that's for, for crazy people to see psychologists. It, it, I mean, you could use it to actually enrich your life. And in conjunction with something like a coach, then you're really, you know, getting building off the insurance, dealing with the deeper issues, but then you can also strive for the best. So it's not just preparing for the worst. It's 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 mm -hmm. looking at all the aspects. That's post traumatic growth. So I think in today's technology, we have so many opportunities with telehealth. We have so many opportunities now with VR in the future with VR kind of therapies. Um, I know we're looking to work with some of these companies like Sias or New Path VR, you know, to see how they, uh, we can work with things. Uh, I, I would love to talk about when they come out. <laughs> and so they're amazing, <laughs> amazing possibilities that are, you know, in the future. And so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to how these things are going to make people connect better and, and, and use the things that already existing. I mean, the, the existing therapies work. I already know this. But for people to really buy into that and to really feel trusting towards that process, they need to do it at their own pace. They need to test those boundaries themselves and find out for themselves at what level they can trust and how to earn that trust Yeah, on both sides. It's like dating. It's like a relationship building. So basically, so far you've mentioned 
building, I guess, the courage and the confidence is, is one aspect where VR can be enormously kind of uh, useful because you remove the more physical primal aspect of, you know, a lot of our fears are connected to the physical presence and stuff because we're animals at the end, right? Uh, but what else? Uh, what are other fields of application? Uh, one of the things that people have talked about is uh, pain management um, because I guess on the basis of distraction, maybe. Uh, are there any other things that you would, uh, I guess, put in the list of, of advantages? Well, pain management also goes back to trauma. A lot of mm -hmm. people that have uh, pain management, they call that a somatoform disorder. A lot of times when not all pain, some pain is very real, but some people would rather not rather, but it's a psychological response. You get this in war sometimes where people cannot feel the psychological trauma because it's too severe. So they form like a physical pain mm -hmm. and that happens often in, in chronic pain where they're just they're unable to feel it so we do psychological tests sometimes it comes up on like the mmpi it'll come up as what they call conversion b and, and you can see it it's 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 real and a lot of doctors will tell their patients oh it's on your head that's really like gaslighting that's telling them oh you don't feel what you feel now they feel more shame on top of their trauma and their pain mm. gets worse but you don't treat yeah. it with psychodynamic. You don't treat it with the therapeutic relationship. You treat those with the evidence-based tools because you don't want to re-trigger their trauma and make their pain worse because they will feel it. And you really have to validate that and, 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 and respect that process when you're working with them because they need to, they just need to decrease the pain. And sometimes only medication can really work in that situation. Mm -hmm. I don't really work with the, that field, although I know experts that do. But that, that's where you would use biofeedback. And that's where you would use a lot of the um, medicine as well as uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. That's that's really awesome. Um, I mean, I think that you've kind of struck on something that I hope more people start to kind of, more clinicians start to buy into this kind of uh, thing. I think it's slow in healthcare. That's my feeling. Um, slow to get into this, you know, whereas game is going like all in. <laughs> soon yeah well we are all suffering now there's a certain amount of psychological pain if doctors could see the value of working alongside psychologists more it might help the nurses right now that are hurting you know there's a lot of trauma in the medical field dealing mm -hmm. with covid and so being able to support the supporters is also important remember these guys are suffering from terrible burnout and it's it's a lot of responsibility if they see a lot of death and if they see a lot of you know uh, hopefully not suicide but if there there is that then we want to protect the providers as well mm. and and so that's a resource for them now a lot of them do seek it out there's the telehealth is being used to the max right now so people mm -hmm. are using it Absolutely. i just don't know about vr in therapy as much yet i would love to see that because the, like this kind of interaction with body language should be able to connect. I love alt space because you get the eyes blinking. It feels real. <laughs> so, <laughs> Zoom is like, you know, it's it's a real face, but it's like the watching the Brady Bunch, you know. There's a burnout to it. You don't get that. So <laughs> it is weird. It's like, hey, Brady Bunch, you know, like what, what is the <laughs> – where are the people? <laughs> Um, sorry, I'm pausing because I was wondering, Marco, was there something you wanted to ask? Oh, yeah. <laughs> in, recently, you entered in, uh, in this project, which is called Peer Mental Health, uh, and you put together health, mentoring and training. So what these three fields have to be, uh, wh why, why these three fields are able to stay together? Well, first of all, uh, you know, thanks for bringing up your mental health. Um, I'm really the, um, the media psychologist on board. I'm the program manager and or the developer. And I want to give some credit here to some of the team because I really, not some, they're, they're, they make this happen. And the, the person who's the CEO and the lead on this is David Eli Israeli. And he came up with simplifying this down to telehealth telementoring and teletraining. So the telehealth is the psychological aspect. That's what I helped set up with. Uh, and we have a licensed psychologist and uh, her name is Marlene Balter. She works with the, the company. It's a separate company. It's a psychological mm -hmm. company uh, corporation and it's called Anibal. And so peer mental health and Anibal are, are like a team and work together. And 
David Israelian from the company Painted Brain. He was the co-founder of Painted Brain, which is a, a company that works with people that have mental health challenges. So their tech company, they've worked with Google and, and, and Awesome Font Awesome and some other uh, really interesting uh companies where they do web development and get people ready for jobs, uh, you know, the photojournalism, social media marketing, a lot of things to encoding, you know, so they can learn how to get, interact. So we formed Peer Mental Health to help get people more jobs because a nonprofit, you cannot, you can't hire people. You can, there, there's restrictions on getting people employed. It's great for the public with a nonprofit and Painted Brain is wonderful. They're, they're actually mentioned uh, in the coalition letter by uh, Governor Newsom in California, uh, because we have this new bill out called SB 803, which allows uh, peers now to bill off of Medi-Cal once they finish their certification program at Painted Brain. So we're working together and we have some things that we're, we're trying to propose to uh, help out people that are you know, stuff in hotels and getting them opportunities to get them back to work. And so that's what uh, David Israelian really brought to this company is all of the resources, all the things that we can help to, to, to employ people. And then we have Paul Robinson, our administrator, who is kind of the inspiration behind Painted Brain. And so we have a, a, an incredible team also of like Kevin, who does our social media, and then uh, Adam Brackney, who's our uh, you, uh, he's uh, like our program manager and helping us to scale this because we want to help out people in other places than just California because we can with VR and the places that we're located. So, and, and there's, there's a lot more to our team. It keeps building, it seems like, but we have, I want to make sure that we really recognize how much effort and time these people put into it because it's really Eli's vision. We call him Eli, his name's David, but mm -hmm. just to keep it from getting confusing with the other David at Painted Brain. But so if I say slip up and say Eli when I mean David, that it's the same person. But they have, uh, any, uh, we've done a lot already to get started. We have a podcast that Paul Robinson helps support. Uh, that I wanted to, plug i guess <laughs> because it's it's a great <laughs> podcast about the homeless and they're really working on trying to get better affordable housing and the name of the person doing that is carrie morrison so if you look for that it's on spotify and apple itunes and all that it's a, uh, it's a great podcast where they really get to some of the root of what i think is going to be plaguing a lot of us now is that we we need to get basic needs that's what fight or flight can kind of bring up in someone. The part of the brain is the amygdala. That's the fear response. But it's also, strangely enough, the part that makes us want to be seen and heard. So that's why mm -hmm. you might see people like looking around the room a lot if they're fearful. They're, they're also checking, you know, they're checking around to see if they're safe, but they're also checking to see if they're seen and heard. I think maybe the brain was designed that way for a reason. But Whatever I reason guess, is, uh, it's connected. I guess something to do with animals not being left behind by the pack, maybe, or something like this. <laughs> yeah. Like when they're, when they're injured, I think. <laughs> <Nice. laughs> yeah. That's kind of the... That's a good... I've never heard that. That's a good... That's interesting. It may be. Talking about uh, another aspect that I'd like to, to, to stay focused with you, uh, technological advance is often about balance, and there are two layers I'd like to, to touch. The first one, uh, the balance between innovators and laggards, or let's say the innovation and the accessibility. So do you think is there any, ch any specific challenge in accessibility for XR, um, XR therapy and uh, uh, XR psychology. I am so excited about this question because I spent I spent <laughs> a lot of time trying to get people in VR that are even homeless. Whoa. And I know this sounds challenging because oh I forgot to mention Heart Forward is the name of the thing that we're the podcast that we're we're doing. So it, let's say someone from listening to Heart Forward is saying, "Well, this doesn't apply to me. VR is like so far off in the future. I'm homeless. I I don't have a place to live." They, they have places and ways that you can get uh, even Obama phones or government phones, as they, I should call them. And um, in the U.S. or California, for instance, if you get one of these phones or even if you get a $50 tablet, but the phones are free because they're paid for by um, their Medi-Cal. So they can get these phones. At, if their processing speed is fast enough, you can do augmented reality with I'll give an example of 
Uh, one is frameVR.io that was owned by Verbella. They can you actually go in and look inside of something off of the browser. So that's augmented reality. You're not even, you could use it with VR with the headset, but you don't need it. So there it is at the entry level. I look at it like, like you go to the Hollywood Bowl here in Los Angeles, everyone's invited. You could have people at the $4,000 seats or the $14 seats, but everyone should really have access to VR and, and at different levels because the, the, the need for it is so high that you know we we should be able to get people at the browser level. I know we have people here at Altspace probably getting in off of their computer. You know, their other program line over Bella can actually go off mm -hmm. the Mac. I, I hope Altspace can one day. But you know, the, the the ability for people to to get into VR is is increasing because the need is going up. That's why it's a challenge to developers now is get please let's find better ways to get people in. Still keep the high end stuff though, because that there's it's like stepping into it you know like some people mm -hmm. can get in the shallow end the deep end and then there's really high end the 8k headsets and the 4k headsets those also those people also have a you know deserve a different place so there's like we were talking about the rift s earlier mm -hmm. you know there's there's a need for that for some and the quest and depending on what their economic situation is and what their business needs are The second level of balance is uh, related to data. I mean, uh, each step into more advanced technologies uh, makes you deal with more refined data like uh, biometric or gaze data. And in general, we are moving towards a near of constant reality capture. So uh, is there a balance? Is, is it possible already to, to to think about the balance between the advantages and the disadvantages of this. I mean, between fair use and misuse. Is it something you take into account? Well, when, in back in 2001, when I was doing an editing job for uh, someone, his name is Doug Prey. He's an Emmy Award winning filmmaker. He was directing a movie about the Dalai Lama and they were collecting data and putting it these tapes his recordings his teachings and they wanted to preserve them because they were getting fungus on them and the dalai lama said about technology then and it's still good because he's still using it now is if you, it depends on how you use it you know what the intent is because if you use technology for human purposes then it, he said there's nothing wrong with that you know but if if it becomes the focus like you think of it like yoda you know use the force be able to use the technology <laughs> For good purposes, it, it seems simple, but it's. I think a lot of us get ahead of the technology, or AI can sometimes instruct us when we should be instructing the AI. Yeah. Um, so that's the balance: is to make sure, like in all the science fiction films that warned us of this, make sure that, like in you know the Terminator films, make sure that John yeah. Connor is in charge, not the Terminator. Yeah, plus uh, it's it's already something you keep into account uh, given the therapist work because uh, you have to protect the identities, you already have to uh, deal with uh, sensitive data. So yeah, right. It's just a different media for the same kind of mission. No, well, they have a lot of people. I know you guys, uh, there's... Uh... There's a lot of people that work with HIPAA encryption. You know, there's, uh, I think, yeah. uh, what, uh, what was her name, Kavya? The the person who's supposed to beat the co Yeah, Kav Kavya. Kavya worked with uh, one of those companies. Walter Greenleaf, I think, was working mm -hmm. with them. I I've met him before in San Francisco at a VR convention. You know, these people that work with HIPAA protected uh boundaries that's what would have to happen for vr to do this because right now you know this is not a secure uh environment for something that could be considered up to hipaa encryption standards now they do have companies like barracuda that bought um you know companies like uh, sukasa those guys have um hipaa encrypted legally protected uh wrappers that they can put around something like that so maybe they could do something like that with uh vr or maybe they already have i don't know what walter is doing with that uh, approach yet but that's what we would be looking for if we we're going to do that mm -hmm. with film and video based therapy excellent um what um what, what about the future what's your kind of idea of where we're heading and what do you think is going to be happening in the next let's say the next 10 years or so 10 15 years what do you expect to see 
Awesome. I know I keep saying awesome it's a bit question vague, because know, you guys are. <laughs> I know, but it's it leaves it open. But it's what I talked about just a second ago with the film and video based <laughs> therapy. I think if VR could make movies like what we were doing on those army bases, or what he was doing, uh, excuse me, I just witnessed one. They could actually <laughs> make this open like what we're doing now. We can make movies in a VR setting, and and that is already shown in clinical trials to reduce post traumatic stress. I think it would be a lot of fun, though. I don't think people would do it because it would be, um, you know, like clinical or, you know, that that's not our goal with peer mental health. What we're doing is we're trying to do wellness assessments to help keep people safe, but also to help figure out where do these people belong? You know, where, mm-hmm. where do they, what, are, what jobs are going to really uh, apply to them? So the, the socialization part is, you know, we'll be doing groups with storytelling. You know, Painted Brain already does storytelling groups. You can go to my website and it will probably direct you to Painted Brain. You can see these uh, storytelling workshops already. So what we're, I see in the future with these filmmaking workshops in VR is that it could be, because uh, I have a, a trademark on something called film and video based therapy. It's not to protect the brand so much. It's to protect the, the sanctity of the license. So that mm-hmm. people understand that when you have a license, you get certain privacy protection and and, and rules that go and ethics that go with that. Right. It's, it's not to discount coaching. It's not to discount the other things, but it does have a different flavor to it. It's not the same thing. And there are certain laws that people need sometimes when they, you know, you get like a Tony Soprano. You don't want him to, <laughs> you don't want, you want to keep his stuff private uh, unless he does something that is Actually, this is an interesting question about HIPAA. If he comes to you and says, I murdered someone in the past, you are legally bound to not tell anyone. If he right. says he's going to in the future, that's different. So there, there are things that you have to, that often not necessarily contradict with the law, but it, it's interesting that they put these uh, ethical guidelines. So, mm-hmm. And all doctors have to abide by that in the U.S. It's different in each country. But the, but that's how important it is to have a license, to have these privacy laws. When we're doing these things to help protect people, we're also trying to look and see what their best is with, with these wellness evaluations. But then we do like mm-hmm. recreational activities. So it, it can then just be a regular support group for these, you know. So could, um, could, could something like um, film therapy and VR look a little bit like I don't know, let's say that we were to do it right here. Now, like we would act out a film, we would kind of write a story, act it out. And so it would be almost like a bit like theater and a film at the same time, because then you could watch it back from different points of view. Or is that a wrong idea? So we're, we're pioneering it. So like, there's a guy by the name of Frank Chindama who has a film school in VR. It's called the Virtual Film School. And so they, they you can move the cameras and lights around just like you would here in your studio. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, you can edit it later. And, and they shot a lot of movies like this. Uh, I know uh, The Mandalorian with Disney, they do this. They did The Lion King, John Favreau. And so a lot of those directors and producers already before COVID were using VR to make feature films, not just the uh, mm-hmm. animated. So to teach people in that environment is already valid. To, to use my trademark with something in another environment, and I wouldn't limit it to just me. I want people to know about this. I want people to steal the idea and do it because I can't develop it. It's something that should be out there for everyone. We can all, free, you know, the license kind of protects the field and the money, but the, and, and the ability to help and heal people. What I want is for us to share this and have a synergy so that people can, can collectively use this and, and, and build these kind of groups. There's enough. I would love to put myself out of business. Think about it. There would be no more suffering in the world. So if we could eliminate (laughs) trauma off the planet, there would be no life either. So the ability to kind of move and grow with all these making these films, the mechanics of it, I think, in VR would be very doable. You know, we've already seen it happen. It's just the shift from teaching to therapeutic practice. Then you run into all those HIPAA problems that we were talking about with the with the privacy. So that that's the trick I think to doing it in VR mm-hmm. is how do you encrypt it properly and how do you and Walter Greenleaf has worked on that with other things. I think he I believe I have not verified that, but I would say that all the people that work with the HIPAA aspect are either are working on it or have uh it in process. If not, I'd be really surprised if, if people mm-hmm. were not diligently working on that. Um 
before we get to the very last question, I just wanted to ask, is there somewhere people, if people wanted to be a part of this, like if people wanted to look into this and kind of uh, contact you guys and, uh, I don't know, somehow be a part of it, where would they have to go? Please go to purementalhealth.com. I'm only giving out one website for this whole thing because I want people to know, first of all, how to remember one thing uh, on this. Yeah, because exactly. There's so many different companies I've mentioned. I mentioned Animal, the Pure Mental Health, and Painted Brain, and uh, it just could go on. I, I want to make it simple like you requested. And, and, mm-hmm. and really think purementalhealth.com. If you want to see our virtual gallery, like we were talking about with the augmented reality, we have a gallery in uh, framevr.io to show you what the USC IGM art gallery looks like now. And we have some examples of a, of a mixer fundraiser, of, of an event that we're planning. Um, so you can see what that might look like in Verbella mm-hmm. later on. And and so that cool. is um, the key to get in, but there's a password. So it's Lynn, capital L, little Y, little N, little N. She's Lynn Crandall is the key to get into the real gallery. So I'm paying tribute to her and she's still, She's here. <laughs> She's not <laughs> gone. But I'm just saying the gallery itself, the physical gallery, is not available because of COVID. So I, okay. you know, want people to know that Lynn is the key to get in. So capital L, little Y, little N, little N, and then um, that that will open up your the the doorway to get into the the USC uh, virtual gallery. And then anyone can get in if, if they have a browser. I know Verbella, you have to download just like AltSpace, but at okay, least people cool. can take a look. But that's that's the website. If they want to sign up, there's a place to register on our website. Just scroll down. We also have a cute little animation. It kind of describes what we talked about earlier with telehealth, telementoring, and teletraining. Okay, cool. Excellent. Um, right, so last question. We ask everyone this one, so feel free to kind of take it in any direction you want. Um, in general, as the title of the podcast is Singularity Watch, we always ask people what the word singular the term singularity means to them so what does it mean to you (laughs) um right now i'm single no um no i think when (laughs) no i'm thinking of singularity it's um it seems to me that we're all one I mean, I could expand on that, but I mean, from a, yeah, a holographic right. point of view or mystical, but it really feels like the, the world is getting closer and we are all one. And if you look up like the holographic universe or the model that we live in, each person that we talk to is like a hologram. I mean, it's like that with reflexology in medicine, right? So if you look at like the foot, you can get the entire body or the ear the, we have in us, in our brains, the entire universe. So at least that's the way I see it. The mystics see it that way, but quantum mechanics also can kind of validate. So if you look up the holographic model, David Boehm, when I think of a singularity, like single particles, like we are all, if you, if you shine a light through a holographic plane, you get the entire picture. And so I, I try to treat each person that way, that mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm speaking to the universe and I'm listening to the universe when I hear that. That's what I think of that. Oh, that's a, an unusual take on it. So I, I like that. Um, makes me think of a future when we're all kind of a hive mind or something. <laughs> but that's a kind of sci-fi way. Uh, yeah, I'm very sci-fi today. So thank you for being here. Um, I found this, uh, you know, really interesting. And I think um, if I took away one thing from it, it was basically when you mentioned, you know, your definition of psychology, kind of what I understood from it was it's about basically feeling right or feeling like you're in okay with yourself that's kind of my idea of what you've given me uh talking about this and uh kind of the anything goes if it can get you there as long as you're not hurting other people of course um yeah the three things i would leave with are it's to me it's all about love the appropriate boundaries and the occasional cheeseburger <laughs> i like that <laughs> excellent and we, on that can we replace it with pizza well, let me think about it. Uh, that might be a different branch of psychology, but no, <laughs> I'm yeah. kidding. Yeah, that's very fine. <laughs> so um, I also want to uh, thank uh, Marco Magnano for being on the show today. Uh, thank you, editor. And uh, uh, hi to Kavya, who isn't here today. And a hi, to, well, not a hi, but thanks to all the rest of the team 
which is uh, Tim Stifladim, DJ Zion, Aspen Darkfire, and Burger Tamagotchi. So you guys, I'm, I'm uh, calling you by your nicknames today, for, by your alter egos. Um, follow us on readyhacker1.com. You can also find us on uh, Facebook or YouTube under the name Singularity Watch, where you can avidly consume our shows and subscribe if you want to keep updated. If you want audio only, you can get that on Spotify, Spreaker, and Apple Podcasts. And that's all for now. Okay. Happy journeys to everyone. Bye.